So I like doing diet experiments, and this month I'm doing a diet that seems quite controversial for many folk. What can I get for you? Could I have 16 plain hamburgers, please? 16 plain ham? Yep, thank you, yeah. And uh, I don't need the bun, just the, just the burger patties on their own, please. And you can just put them all in one box, they don't need to be separate. Is that everything for you? Uh, just a cup of tea as well, please. A cup of tea as well. Right, that's ordered. 37 for next one for you. Okay, thanks. That's great. Everything for you, is it? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Right. Game on. I'm going to eat nothing but McDonald's burger patties for a whole month. But wait a minute, didn't that guy already do that in the film Super Size Me? No. <laughs> I'm eating at McDonald's, but nothing like the diet that Morgan Spurlock ate in his documentary about how unhealthy McDonald's food is. Like Morgan Spurlock, I'm going to eat as much as I want to, to feel fully satisfied. But I'm not going to eat the bun, the sauce, the fries, the coke or the ice cream. I'm only going to eat the beef and nothing else. Now, why would anyone do that, least of all a nutritionist and a professional athlete who normally looks after their diet pretty closely? I understand that a lot of folk might think this is pretty crazy. <laughs> so just briefly, there's four questions that I'm interested in exploring with this experiment. One is, is it the meat that's actually the unhealthy part of processed food? And two, is there a way to break the relationship that people, individuals and the wider society actually has to junk food in general? The third reason is, is there a role for more extreme diets or more extreme interventions in general in health and nutrition to actually deal with this problem? And the fourth reason is, given that different aspects of health and nutrition can be pretty controversial, especially on social media, is there a way for people like you and I to ask questions and to be sceptical in public without it being a very stressful experience or even being cancelled. <laughs> now, I know from conversations both in private and in public on social media that a lot of people have questions about nutrition that they're actually scared to ask for fear of backlash and that doesn't really seem like a very healthy position for society to be in. So I wonder is that fear and reluctance to talk about these subjects actually necessary and is there a way to navigate this without it being too much of a stressful experience? Well I guess I'm going to find out. <laughs> So in the time that I've been studying nutrition, one theme that's kind of increased in the public discourse is the idea that meat, and especially red meat, is an important, if not the central agent, that actually makes Western junk food unhealthy. Now that's not really reflected in the totality of the scientific evidence, and so I have a worry that it might make things worse if people feel that just removing the meat will actually improve a Western diet. And that's one thing that this experiment of mine is aimed at highlighting. Obviously what I'm doing isn't science, it's essentially a stunt. I've actually done carnivore diets of eating only beef several times before and I'm personally pretty confident of what effect eating only burger patties from McDonald's will have or actually not have on my health. But I hope that it's going to be interesting or maybe even thought provoking for some of you if you think that this diet might have quite dramatic effects on my health in either direction. So what exactly am I actually going to eat? So for one month, I'm going to eat only the standard beef burger patties from McDonald's without anything else, not the fries, the bun, the sauce, or anything else. I'm going to eat as many as I need to to feel completely satisfied, and I'm not going to put any upper or lower limit on that. I'm just going to let my appetite decide. I'm going to continue drinking tea since that's necessary for life. <laughs> and I do have milk in my tea, so I will get some calories and nutrients from the milk, but not a lot. And I will also probably drink a few non-caloric drinks which are artificially sweetened. Finally, if I need to eat early in the morning because I'm going out to work or I'm going climbing, then I'll just have eggs from McDonald's since they don't serve burgers until 11 a.m. But I'm gonna try and keep that to an absolute minimum. So McDonald's burger patties are 30% protein, 70% fat, and 93 calories each. So I dare say that I'm going to need to eat about 16 or probably more than that to meet my appetite needs. But I'm not really sure yet, I'll just let my appetite decide. So I'm going to go and get some beef and then I'll talk a bit more about my reasons for actually doing this. So what actually is it about processed food that's unhealthy? Possibly that's the most important unanswered question in the world of nutrition at the moment. It's kind of taken as a given that processed food isn't good for you, but this is kind of vague. Are we talking all processed food? For example, is fruit unhealthy if you put it in a processor? What about cooking food? That's the original form of processing. 
you know, there's plenty of folk who would never consider eating in McDonald's, but are nonetheless quite unhealthy because of their diet. And so I'm kind of interested with this video and this experiment and kind of drilling down a bit into the question of what is it about processed food that's unhealthy? And especially the question, is it the meat? <laughs> Morgan Sporlock's documentary, Super Size Me, did draw attention to something that might seem kind of obvious, which is that McDonald's food, when taken as a whole, is unhealthy. And it, he effectively showed how dramatically eating fast food can destroy your health. Because he ate nothing but McDonald's for a month, he showed the negative health effects on a time scale that's a bit more relatable to people. You know, you might think selfishly, well, I don't eat in McDonald's, so this, art, this discussion doesn't apply to me. But I think it does apply to you for two reasons. First of all, many of the young, fit rock climbers who watch this channel do eat plenty of processed foods, maybe not from McDonald's, but can you be sure that it isn't just as bad? You know, the effects of eating these foods might not manifest themselves as obviously as obesity in athletes, but I suspect that they do in other ways, most notably problems with mental health, such as anxiety and depression, which are a big problem across young, fit, athletic populations. The second issue is what affects the whole of society is going to affect you personally in the end. You know, the progression of obesity over the course of my lifetime is really frightening. And if the current trend continues, some scientists are saying that it's going to reach 90% of all adults in Western countries will be overweight or obese by 2050. So if you think that you're not going to become one of those people, then why does this actually matter? And it matters because no healthcare system can function under that pressure. Yeah, a lot of uh, people watching this video might not spend a lot of time thinking about these problems until they tear up their meniscus in their knee. You can, in the UK, technically still get surgical or other medical treatment for these things on the NHS, but uh, likely now you're gonna to have to wait years for it. And how many years long does the waiting list have to get before we recognize that the system is failing under the pressure it's under? I would say that it's already well down that road and it's gonna get a lot worse. No healthcare system is going to survive the situation where almost 100% of the population is metabolically sick. So whether you're currently fit and healthy or not, the loss of your healthcare system is, going to, is something that's going to cause you pain at some point in your life. We can just pour more and more money into the problem like the US has done, but it won't make any difference in the end. Because despite all the trillions that Americans spend on healthcare, they are still the unhealthiest population on earth and getting worse. So we're all kind of heading in the same direction here. And the cause of all this, of course, is diet related disease. <laughs> Exercise does play a role as well, but we're not going to solve this problem without understanding and looking at diet. I personally became interested in nutrition because I've always struggled against overweight for my whole adult life. Um, I've only actually carried significant overweight myself in my teenage years, but I would say that I've battled to keep it at bay ever since. And I've always had the question, does this have to be a battle? There are so many millions of things in your physiology that are incredibly tightly regulated. So what is it about modern food that throws such a massive spanner in the works? And through researching nutrition myself, I've managed to resolve my personal struggles with overweight and a few other health issues at the same time. And if you're interested in how I did that, I made a very detailed video about it, which I'll link to. But aside from my own personal struggles, I couldn't help but get kind of immersed and involved in the issue of how to deal with diet-related disease at a population level, what's called public health nutrition. And so that's how I ended up doing a master's degree in nutrition. I wanted to see how the academic and professional nutrition world approach this problem and how they develop the views and the policies that they have because to be totally honest some of them i didn't really understand so instead of dramatic change public health nutritionists tend to favor trying to tinker with the western diet in order to take the edge off the negative health effects like things like a bit less salt a bit less sugar a bit less saturated fat and putting calories on the menus and that kind of thing. I do sympathise with that approach and I see why nutri the nutrition world takes that approach. But the issue that I have with it is that it just isn't working. We, you know, we're still on track to reach almost the whole population metabolically sick and have no healthcare system in a few decades. That's a really huge problem and I think that we really need uh, an, another strategy. Not necessarily something to replace the existing strategy, it could also just add to the existing strategy. Just while I'm on the subject of engaging with this problem of uh, junk food and the junk food environment, one of the many criticisms that folks have made of my diet experiment just now is that I'm advertising McDonald's. And I do understand that point, but 
I think that that particular horse bolted about 25 years ago. Uh, I certainly don't want to help McDonald's, but they're everywhere. They're totally ubiquitous. Everyone is aware of them. And, you know, in the UK, more than half the calories that are eaten are eaten outside the home. And that figure is rising really quickly. You know, people are looking for a way to exist in the world of McDonald's and not get sick. And I think that public health nutrition really needs to find a way to help people to actually do that. Right, that'll do for ranting at the moment. Let's go and do a bit of bouldering before it gets dark. That was good. That's a wee milestone. <sighs> Interestingly, and um, you know, I'm on day six, I think, of this experiment of eating McDonald's burger patties. Um, this morning, I had quite a lot of work to do, um, and with it being the end of November, the it gets dark at four o'clock, so I needed to get out here and and climb. Um, so there wasn't time, because I'm still in the Highlands, there wasn't time to go to McDonald's um, in the city, Inverness, uh, which is just 10 minutes up the road, and then come here. So I decided just to come here first. So I don't know what time it is now, about three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, I haven't eaten since 7 p.m. last night. I had three burger patties then. Um, and I'm ready to eat now, but, I'm not hungry in the way that I would normally be if I was on a mixed diet, where I wouldn't really be able to do what I've just done. <laughs> um, I would just get hungry and tired and fatigued, feel weak. Um, this is a thing that's common to uh, ketogenic diets, in my experience, for me at least. Um, this is something that's common to ketogenic diets in general, not just um, carnivore diets or this specific type of carnivore diet. But it is interesting that um, that occurs nonetheless. But I must say that uh, right now I feel really good. Really good. And I've just done a link that I couldn't do before. So that's excellent. Let's hope it stays that way. <laughs> I might feel terrible uh, later on. Hopefully not. One thing that annoying people have asked me is, don't McDonald's burgers have lots of fillers and additives or chemicals in them? No, they're just beef, same as the beef in your steak from the supermarket. There's actually quite a nice video on YouTube which I'll link to of a team trying to remake a Big Mac from scratch. And they point out that a Big Mac has 55 ingredients and some of them have quite scary chemical names but are actually quite benign and others are very familiar to us such as flour but are actually potentially a problem in the diet for some people. But the actual burger has just one ingredient which is beef and it's cooked on a metal grill in its own fat with no added oils. They do add salt and pepper to the burgers which I have no issue with. Beef and eggs are the most nutritionally complete foods on McDonald's menu and in fact in your supermarket. <laughs> Only organ meats like liver or some seafood can actually compete with them for nutrients that are commonly limited in the human diet. I mentioned earlier that the idea that meat's unhealthy isn't reflected in the evidence and I could get into a really big discussion of evidence in this video and it could get very very long but I don't think I'm going to do that here. I think I'll just summarise a couple of key points that underline why I personally have no worries about the healthiness of eating lots of red meat. So here is the latest meta-analysis on red meat and some key health outcomes. The effects on health are tiny. In the paper they say, we estimate that consuming unprocessed red meat across an average range of exposure levels increases the risk of subsequent colorectal cancer, breast cancer, IHD and type 2 diabetes, at least slightly compared to eating no red meat by at least 6%, 3%, 1% and 1% respectively. These effects are so close to null that I'm just not convinced that eating red meat is a risk to health. Now these associations are still there and you might want to assume that they're causal and avoid eating red meat and that's your choice but I would just pose the question how do you know that this effect is not simply down to the unhealthy user bias of meat eaters? We know that meat eaters tend to make a whole host of other poor lifestyle choices. 
these studies try to correct for this, but the so-called residual confounding remains. If I were going to make my food decisions based on these types of data, I'd want to see a much stronger effect to avoid the possibility that what we're actually seeing here is that red meat intake is actually a marker of unhealthy people, the type of people who eat whole McDonald's meals, rather than a maker of unhealthy people. Now, you could turn that question around and say, how do you know that it's not a small but real effect of eating red meat? Well, just using the same type of research, you can see that when you look at red meat or animal protein intake outside of the context of the American or Americanized diet, the association actually often runs the opposite way. People across Europe or some Asian countries who eat more red meat have less of these key diseases, the same ones discussed in the paper a moment ago. This lends weight to the idea that something else about the American diet is actually the causative agent. But hang on a minute, <laughs> didn't the World Health Organization declare red meat as a probable carcinogen a few years ago? Yes, they did. <laughs> to me, this is an excellent example of why we need to verify the claims of institutions, especially those who have influence from politics and business. It's fine to listen to those institutions, but I think it's important to check that the data they present actually matches their conclusions. So yes, a team from the World Health Organization spent two years looking at the evidence associating red meat and cancer. They reviewed 800 studies on this topic and one of their most reported findings was on colorectal cancer. And of those 800 studies, they found 14 that looked at the association of red meat intake and colorectal cancer. 13 of those 14 studies showed no significant relationship. <laughs> the one study they found that did show a positive association between red meat and colon cancer was this one. Even in this, the association was only significant in people who were already over fat and had other differences in diet quality. The final couple of sentences of the paper sum this up quite nicely and they say increased risk due to red meat intake occurred only at lower legume intakes and higher body mass. These associations raise the possibility that the risk due to red meat intake is mediated by multiple mechanisms, one of which may involve red meat in a constellation of causal factors that produce higher plasma insulin levels. <laughs> to me that sounds like the classic tortured language that you often see in papers of this type where either they don't, the authors don't know what to conclude from their own data or they actually do know what to conclude from their own data but don't want to say it because they will know that the paper won't get published. I think what they really could have said is there's no strong evidence that there, this relationship with red meat and colorectal cancer is actually causal. If it really was red meat that was causing colon cancer, you'd have to explain why nearly all of the studies they looked at found no association with red meat and colon cancer, but also why in that one study that did find a relationship, it's only strong in people who are already unhealthy. In the absence of any stronger evidence, I think it's natural to conclude that unhealthy people who are overweight tend to get colon cancer and they also tend to eat more red meat. Both are a consequence of their unhealthy lifestyle. What about the flip side of that coin, the idea that eating more vegetables to replace animal foods would improve health? And the picture is actually consistent in the evidence. So here's the latest study on vegetable intake and cardiovascular disease. There is a small inverse relationship between raw vegetable intake, but interestingly not cooked vegetables, and cardiovascular disease. But their analysis shows that nearly all of the effect is explained by residual confounding. In other words, people who eat more vegetables lead healthier lifestyles, and this accounts for the effect. They exercise more, they smoke and drink less, and they're more educated and wealthy. Just so I'm clear, I'm not saying that vegetables aren't healthy food, generally speaking, but there's not a clear picture from the evidence that animal foods aren't healthy either, or that replacing them with vegetables actually improves health. And so based on that WHO report and the totality of the evidence in general, I'm actually not worried about eating red meat. And if you find their conclusion that eating red meat is in fact a probable cause of cancer compelling, then just don't eat it. I'm not encouraging you to eat in any particular way. I'm just explaining my own choices. So that's a quick skip over some of the health arguments, but I'm going to change tack for a second and think about ethics and environment. That's one thing that people have asked me a lot about is the climate effects and the ethics of eating this way from McDonald's. And I come back to the point of the exercise, which is it's an experiment to help look for ways to potentially break people's relationship with junk food from big corporate entities like McDonald's who don't care about either ethics or the environment. Yes, I'm eating McDonald's here for a month or two, 
but it's a short term experiment. The objective is to help find ways to make this type of food less appealing. The reality is its supply is not going anywhere until its demand falls and that will probably have to be led with a bottom-up approach individual by individual and I'll get to that as the month goes on. Now with that said I do eat red meat on a regular basis as part of my normal diet. I don't actually like it all that much I just eat it because it's actually good for me and if it's properly produced that's the key point red meat production can actually be good for the environment and aside from this month I try and source what I can direct from farmers who produce it in that way. With proper farming methods that's the key Red meat can be produced and eaten in a way that's climate neutral or even climate negative, i.e. causing global cooling. And moreover, it can improve biodiversity and the health of the soil. It all hinges on how it's produced. There aren't there big well-known analyses of global food production that show that reducing meat consumption and replacing that with plant foods is an excellent way to reduce your carbon emissions. Yes, there are. <laughs> But those analyses contain two fundamental flaws which may result in reaching the completely wrong answer with respect to sustainability of the food supply, in my opinion. The first error is that they measure food in kilograms or calories. Why do they do that? Probably because that's what's easy to measure, you know, it's what we have to hand. But is it the right measure? Oh, I don't think so, no. Optimum nutrition is not measured in kilograms eaten. And what about calories? Well, yes, a certain amount of calories are needed from foods, but we can't ignore the other things that we need from food. Things like absorbable protein with the correct ratio of amino acids, the vitamins, the minerals, the trace elements, and also the absence of anti-nutrients which interfere with the absorption of those other nutrients. If we do ignore those things, then we get to some kind of ridiculous places. For example, Pure cane sugar has the lowest carbon footprint of any food <laughs> and that's all calories and no nutrients and that's what we're going to get if we prioritise energy as the measure of interest in sustainable food production. The second major flaw with these analyses is what you leave out. You know, often carbon emissions per kilo or calorie of food is the measure. But even within that measure, carbon lost from the soil when it's ploughed and washed away is left out. Again, probably that's because it's hard to measure. And it also happens slowly, you know, over tens or probably hundreds of years. But if the definition of sustainability is to mean anything, then something as critical as the integrity of the soil has got to be considered. You know, if we have no soil, then we have no food. <laughs> the irony is that these analyses often present a picture that plant foods use far less land, which is only true if you look at a snapshot of extractive agriculture in time. The soil under that agricultural land was made with animals on the land, and maybe it's slowly degrading with crop production which is absent animals. So if we look in the long term, which is the definition of sustainability, then crop production may not in fact use less land, and possibly it will even use all of it if it degrades one location after another, and obviously that's not sustainability. So that's the transactional argument, you know, how to feed a population without destroying the environment. But what about the ethics? You know, taking the life of an animal to feed yourself? Yeah, isn't that just an open and shut case? If you can avoid animal death, then avoid it. And of course that makes sense. But the question is, can you avoid it just because the animal isn't on your plate? Let's say you swap out beef for soy or wheat or vegetables or fruits, you know, the plant crops. How do you plant a crop without first killing all the animals that lived on that land by clearing it and ploughing it? If I just buy plant foods that are produced by ploughing and then fertilising with mined NPK and then killing pests and then harvesting, then everything has been killed to make way for my crop, right down to the microbes in the soil. Almost all the animals that live in this field have been killed. <laughs> the worms, the insects, the rodents, the birds, the small predators and actually the large herbivores. And even once you plant the crop, how do you raise that crop without killing the animals who would compete with you to eat that plant? How do you fertilise the soil without animals on the land to make manure and then ultimately eroding the soil and washing it into the sea where it kills the life there and then needing to move on to some other piece of land somewhere else? I don't actually know of a source of food that can achieve any of these basic ethical standards except animal foods, although I obviously then have to accept that the animal that's raised for food needs to be killed. If I think of food production with any sort of realistic 
framework of how ecosystems work. I feel that I have to accept that. You know, if I think that I might buy potatoes or lentils instead of steak, and that would result in fewer animals dead, it forces me to ignore the realities of producing this food, and I'm just not prepared to do that. Now, obviously, it's critical that animals are raised and slaughtered in an ethical manner, which minimises, if not eliminates, suffering. And I think that is achievable, although it's certainly not always achieved, which is a major problem. I suspect that most people would agree that that is a problem, and I think it's probably the solution to it is where the disagreement may lie. As with the environmental aspect of food production, it all hinges on how animal or plant foods are produced. Maybe this video might be one small nudge to shame McDonald's into producing beef that is climate neutral as measured by balancing emissions from methane from the cows and carbon dioxide sinks in soils and also into producing meat that is not fed any human edible grain unless it's waste products. It's a shame that it always takes a shaming to get McDonald's to do things properly. They're clearly a very well organised business and they could do this if they wanted to. They probably won't know because it's profit that's all that matters. The more important point for you and I is that McDonald's is just one head of the Hydra. We're fighting junk food on every front and that brings me to the next reason why I'm doing this experiment. So I'm in Drumchapel today, just on the west end of Glasgow, and I've come here because uh, there is a McDonald's here along with several other junk food places. There's KFC there, McDonald's there, Greg's, Burger King, Starbucks, and a uh, bingo gambling place. Um, I remember when um, this shopping centre got built, um, so this, and Drumchapel is a kind of kind of deprived part of Glasgow. I grew up just 10 minutes along the road from here myself. Um, and when this place got built, I kind of wondered what shops they would put there. And when they built this like whole series of uh, junk food outlets, I must say that it really annoyed me. Um, made me kind of angry and not many things make me angry. Um, but it's just the way that they, there's nothing else on offer, just junk food and that's it. And it made me kind of sad that like so many places in, in major cities are, are like this. Trump Chapel was actually built with really good intentions. It was built to house people who had been moved out of this, the inner city slums, the tenements in, in Glasgow, because they were so overcrowded and really unsuitable for large amounts of people. We were told we were living in slums and they and we had to go. So we went to a different kind of slum in the country called Drum Chapel. But uh, Billy Connolly was actually one of the people who was moved out here uh, from those tenements. And he famously said that... Now we all had indoor plumbing. The problem was we'd fuck all else. When they took us there, there was no amenities. It was a crime to move thousands of people to a housing estate with no cinemas, no theatres, no cafes, no shops, no churches, no schools, just houses. And that has it exactly right, you know, they built the housing, which was fine, that was good, but they didn't build all the other infrastructure that goes with living a good, for a population to live kind of a good life. So there's kind of a vacuum really, and in that vacuum stepped junk food and drinking and gambling and all of these things. And I just think that that's kind of sad and that's why when I drive past this shopping centre every time I go between Glasgow and home, it just signifies that transition where these big corporate uh, entities that uh, that are kind of predatory in a way, and they just take over and it feels like there's nothing can, can be done and that, that makes me kind of angry. There you go, another round of burgers. I was listening to Billy Connolly saying that his escape, what saved his life from, from this place was going out on his bike into the Copatic Hills which are just over there um, and exploring the hills and widening his horizons. Cycling from Drumchapel was a very important part of my life. It released me from Drumchapel and took me off into the country. And that's exactly the same thing that happened to me. I lived, like I say, just a few minutes along the road and I cycled out on my bike to escape the town um, as a 15 year old and I discovered hills and cliffs and my life was changed forever. So I can really relate to that. Faceless councillors in Glasgow had dispatched us out here and we were supposed to feel great because we had a bath. But you know, you can only spend so much of your time in the bath playing with your rubber ducks and things. Most people that live here don't find that. They have to look to build their own life. 
within this place. So these corporates like McDonald's, they have such an amount of power and that power comes from money and that comes from their profit and their profit arises from three ingredients which are flour, vegetable oil and sugar. Those three ingredients make up 60% of the calorie intake of Americans, which is just mind blowing to me. And of course the UK is heading in the same direction. And the reason that's the case is because those three ingredients are extremely cheap to produce. They're extremely profitable and that's why they're universal in junk food, whether it's junk food you buy at the supermarket or from McDonald's. The other thing about those three ingredients is that they're very, very palatable. Someone even goes far as to say addictive. If everyone magically uh, turned on their head what foods they chose from McDonald's menu and started to choose different foods that were higher in, in protein and not containing those three ingredients, then their business model would really quickly fall apart. And of course, it's not really realistic to think that everyone's going to do that. I, d I don't think that at all. But what it can do is possibly, it might not break McDonald's, but it might break that individual's relationship to McDonald's or junk food in general. I've been eating just these burger patties for the past few weeks. I'm losing a little bit of body fat and normalizing my appetite. I feel a, a complete absence of any uh, cravings or, or desires to eat um, junk food, high calorie food, um, and I'm just not hungry between meals. Whereas normally if, if I'm eating a more mixed diet with some of those foods in, I can't just eat some because there's a constant low level craving to eat more and that's how these businesses operate. That's why they have so much profit and power. And I feel that if I had to eat this way indefinitely, whether it's beef from a steak or beef from McDonald's, I, I, I don't think I would have this draw towards junk food. It's, it's sort of broken the, the link, if you like. And I can't help but wonder if, um, if other people ate this way in general, if even a subset of them would have the same experience, a break in the, in the, in the link of the desire to, to eat junk food on a regular basis. Um, and if that can prevent that draw towards junk food, maybe it can prevent it becoming a lifestyle that is lifelong and in, in so doing prevent the metabolic diseases that result from that lifestyle. I don't know if that's true or not and my little experiment can't show that either way. But I do think that if that were achievable, that would be a pretty good deal for that individual. And it also would be just a little thorn in the side of McDonald's. And I must say, I do like the sound of that. So over the past month on social media, some folk have called this diet that I'm doing extreme. And I don't really blame people for that. It's not what they're used to seeing. You know, I probably wouldn't need to actually do this experiment if I thought that people would see it as a reasonable diet. I mean, I've already done carnivore diets of beef only several times before, and I, and I know how they work. So obviously people are going to think it's extreme. But the question is, is it actually extreme? <laughs> and I think that depends a bit on your point of view. You know, if you'd asked me six years ago if a diet of all beef was extreme, I'd have thought, obviously, yes but less so now. <laughs> For one thing, eating very large amounts of ruminant meat is a diet that we are evolutionarily adapted to. And if you don't think that's correct, then please consider the radioisotope data, which is quite clear and compelling on this issue. Notice though that I said it's a diet that we're adapted to, not the diet. Although there are many features of human morphology and physiology that show that we are adapted to carnivorous diets, it's also true that we have adaptations to omnivorous diets and that likely plays a role in why we've succeeded in spreading all over the globe and dominating multiple ecological niches. To me, these days, it's the standard Western diet that seems extreme. No diet in human history has been able to cause a population-wide transition to obesity, diabetes, fatty liver, or cancer in just a couple of generations. And to my mind, that's extreme. But regardless if this diet or that diet is extreme, that's not really the interesting question to me. Extreme can be good. The question is, is the diet useful or not? Now, over my adult life, I've had my foot in a few different camps, and that's really what's led me to be doing these sorts of experiments. On one thing, I've been part of climbing culture, which is, or maybe was, <laughs> very independent of mainstream culture. Climbers have lived extreme lives and they've taken calculated risks and gone to places where no one's gone before. And the same goes for the culture of elite sport and sports science more generally. You know, the most successful athlete, by definition, is the one who goes to the most extreme lengths. So my bias is naturally to see that there can be a lot of value in doing things which are extreme. 
and certainly not dismissing them out of hand. It's kind of odd to me to celebrate extremes in training and sport performance and then dismiss extremes out of hand in other fields such as nutrition. I've also got my interest in public health and that field seems to take a much less forceful approach to optimising health. Now, there is good reason for that. We have to be really careful about intervening to actually control people's lives. The other thing is that lots of policies are just an experiment and despite the potential costs of impinging on folks' freedom, they don't always work or sometimes they actually make things worse. So as a result of that, public health recommendations tend to be quite different from something like a training programme that a coach might give an athlete. In both cases, they're quite cautious and careful, and both are willing to make quite bold decisions on a strategy if it seems right. Possibly the difference is that in sport, coaches and athletes are more willing to rapidly assess the effectiveness of, of a strategy and then change course, either going all in on a strategy that works well or abandoning it if it fails. Public health, by contrast, seems to hold on to failing strategies well past the point where it should have become obvious that they failed. Sometimes it actually digs into dogmas which appear to need adjusting purely because that's the established policy. And I'm thinking here of things like the dietary guidelines. The other side to this is that they're often compromised with political or financial conflict of interest. And this makes public health institutions well positioned to give bad advice, unfortunately. These problems with public health at a population level are not so easy to solve, and I certainly don't underestimate them. And that's partly why I actually like the bottom-up approach with individual by individual researching and testing strategies. In my view, your best resource for this is PubMed, the primary literature, and your best assets in using that tool are curiosity and skepticism. There is a lot of bullshit out there coming from all sides and looking at the actual scientific evidence is the only way that I know that's reliable to wade through it all and come out with the right answer. So if you experiment and the diet you settle on actually works and meets your health goals but it doesn't fit the cultural norm that you live in, that might be an uncomfortable position for some folk. If you look at the comments on my Instagram when I was telling folk about doing this experiment this month, you'll see that I had to absorb a whole mix of detailed pushback, as well as some anger and even attempts to humiliate. I don't think everyone could actually stomach that. Of course, you don't need to experiment in public, as I have, but likely you'll still have to justify deviating from the cultural norm with your family and friends at a minimum, and I have to say it does make it a lot easier if you just have some familiarity with the scientific literature. However, there's another upside to so-called extreme diet experiments. If they're well chosen by the people who might benefit from them, they can have pretty dramatic effects, and therein lies their strength. You know, I first became interested in the carnivore diet just as a curiosity, but when I tried it for this first time, eating steak rather than burgers in that case, but still just beef, I completely cured the lifelong eczema that I'd had on my feet. But that had given me daily pain for 40 years, and I spent a bit of time in hospital for it as a kid, unable to walk, and I'd relied on steroid medication daily for decades. All of that was finished in two days of a carnivore diet. That is pretty good as a result, and it's still on my list to make a video specifically on that at some point in the future. In this experiment, the main finding I've been having is the total absence of craving for other junk foods that tend to lead to the excess weight gain that I've struggled with my whole life. My weight and my appetite have normalized at the same time. Often the traditional approaches to control excess weight lean on calorie restriction and therefore they force you to trade excess fat for hunger <laughs> and therein lies the failure of that approach. So if you're going to dismiss a diet that seems extreme, well that's fine, you eat however you like, I'm not trying to encourage you to adopt any diet, but I would just ask the question, what's the basis for the objection? I don't see anything wrong with extreme per se. So should everyone eat this way? Of course not, but possibly for those with a habit or a craving for junk food that's proved impossible to break with the standard methods, or those who've got excess fat accumulation, or inflammatory conditions like the eczema that I used to have, extreme diets might at minimum help you to find some clues about what factors actually contribute to those, or as in my case, they might just resolve them altogether. You might only need to do extreme diets such as a carnivore diet temporarily. The key to all this comes back to looking carefully at the evidence. There's lots of extreme diets that I wouldn't do. You're not going to find me doing a vegan diet, for example. I just don't have a reason to do that. But with that said, I might do something that's a bit more evidence-based and fairly close to a vegan diet, which is a rerun of a previous experiment that I'd like to do again. 
more on that in another episode. But overall, the fourth and final reason that I'm doing this stunt of this diet at McDonald's is to encourage folk, even if it's only a tiny proportion of people, to look beyond the newspaper headlines or the social media influencers and verify their claims in the actual primary scientific literature. Just on this platform alone of YouTube, you've got people telling you that meat is going to kill you and also that plants are going to kill you. And how else are you going to decide who is actually right? I'm a nutritionist and I would love to tell you that there was a trustworthy source of information from influencers, but unfortunately, I don't think there is. It's absolutely fine to listen to what all these people have to say and it's really important you actually do so. But the important point here is to verify that what they say actually matches the evidence. So here I am eating only beef for a month and I'm quite confident that you'll find quite a few comments below saying that this is going to be bad for my health and will even harm my performance in the short term. But can you actually find any evidence that meat causes poor health outcomes? Good luck with that. What people will post below are studies showing that meat associates with very small negative health outcomes. But what they won't post are the studies showing the exact opposite. And that to me indicates that a covariate of meat consumption could actually explain any causal effect. It's getting into looking in a bit more detail at the evidence like this where you're likely to get closer to a useful answer to these questions. And if that seems like an awful lot of work, I would just ask, do you have a better alternative? Because I must say that I don't. When I reached the intended one month of diet experiment, I decided to keep going for another couple of weeks since I felt really good. My weight had dropped steadily during the whole month by 3.5 kilos. Moreover, I had simply been unable to eat more than 16 patties per day. I was curious if either of these trends would continue. Surely, if I continued, my weight ought to settle out at a new lower equilibrium and appetite and food intake would surely rise to replace the energy liberated from stored fat. I had to keep going to find out. <laughs> I had intended to take my blood test at my local doctor's office, but when I called to make the appointment, the next available spot was well into the next month. <laughs> so I was kind of forced to decide to keep going out to eight weeks, with three days off for family evening mixed meals over Christmas. Yes! <sighs> So here's my last burger, thank goodness. <laughs> just one more thing before we get to the results. Although I've just said that science is the only tool that I know of that can weed out bullshit online, I still think it's important to share your own experience and thoughts on social media and not be afraid to make your voice heard. You know, the way social media often works is to amplify the loudest and most strident voice, and that can really distort the picture and make it seem like certain ideas are well accepted, such that eating red meat is unhealthy, when that's actually not a view that's either supported by the evidence or actually held by all that many people. A lot of folk are actually scared to pose questions about nutrition in public or post their thoughts for fear of backlash or being shut down. Now, I have had plenty of pushback for pointing out that meat is a healthy food, but this process of questioning the current fashion for avoiding meat has actually been okay overall. In one way, it would be easier to stay below the parapet and not to make this video, but I would find that hard to do since athlete after athlete contacts me telling me that their health has suffered for iron deficiency anemia or that they can't understand why they keep having recurring health problems despite eating a healthy vegan diet. If you put yourself out there and post things, you will always have someone who disagrees with you and possibly even a few people who want to shame you into shutting up. You can't go that far wrong though, as long as you explain your reasoning clearly and if it's an issue of science then just use the evidence to support your views where the evidence exists and be clear where you're speculating beyond the available evidence. You know, people can legitimately disagree with your opinions and you've got to expect that. You know, you're not going to please everyone, but if people actually attack you personally rather than the argument, then they're really not worth bothering with. You know, I'm doing this experiment because my reading of the evidence leads me to think that red meat is in fact a healthy food and I hypothesise that eating only red meat from McDonald's or otherwise will not affect my health negatively and might even help to regulate my body weight. The basis of that hypothesis comes from lots of different strands of evidence, paleoanthropology, evolutionary biology, nutrient requirements for humans, nutrient provision from red meat, and some of the trials and epidemiology I've already mentioned. However, I can't know for sure using scientific evidence. The available scientific evidence actually testing the effects of a full carnivore diet in humans is extremely limited hence the n equals one experiment. If this hypothesis is wrong and eating large amounts of red meat is in fact a bad actor or the bad actor in McDonald's food, 
then I should see effects similar to or worse than Morgan Spurlock did in Super Size Me. Time to find out. So now I'm shooting this footage a couple of months after finishing the experiment and I've had time to reflect on it and put together this video. So let's go through the results of eight weeks of eating nothing but McDonald's burger patties. First, I'll tell you exactly what I did actually eat. Initially, I struggled to eat 16 patties per day and some of the days I only managed about, say, 12 to 15. That wasn't because I found them either boring or unpalatable. Contrary to what some folk have asked me, they weren't dry or unappealing. They are certainly not as hyper palatable as the whole product with the bun and everything, but they're not unpleasant either. They're just kind of neutral. <laughs> the reason I couldn't eat more was simply because I just wasn't hungry. Likely I wasn't hungry because I was losing weight. My body was readily liberating excess fat into circulation, as it usually does on a ketogenic diet, and so I naturally gravitated towards two meals per day. I just didn't want to eat anything before about one or two in the afternoon on most days. I actually tried at every meal to eat as much as I possibly could since I felt that I just wasn't eating enough, but I experienced a hard stop in appetite and I would have had to make myself uncomfortable to eat any more. I'll come to weight in a second, but I was steadily losing weight for the first month and then my weight remained stable for the second month. So it was actually really useful to continue for that second month to see if it did in fact stabilise at the new lower weight. During that second month, I did eat a bit more, regularly managing 16 burgers per day and occasionally maybe one or two more. Remember also that I was getting additional calories from milk in my tea, which I do drink a lot of. And remember also that estimates of calories on food labels are very inaccurate and so for both reasons it's difficult to accurately estimate the calorie intake that I actually had. Likely though the figure would lie between 2,000 and 2,500 calories. On maybe six or seven mornings where I had long days at work or climbing planned, I had eggs for breakfast. Two of those were on a work trip where I ate the eggs from the hotel that I was staying at rather than driving across town to eat McDonald's eggs and I did have a few normal meals over three days at Christmas with my family and that was kind of close to the end of the eight weeks. So since I was getting some carbs in my diet from a few hundred mils of milk in my tea and because McDonald's burgers are somewhat overcooked <laughs> I did take some supplemental vitamin C Fresh meat is a known antiscorbutic, i.e. it contains vitamin C, but overcooking meat destroys vitamin C. So given that I had no control over how it was cooked and the carb intake may have increased my vitamin C requirement, I thought it might be prudent to just cover this with a supplement. On previous carnivore diet experiments where I can cook my own meat much more gently, then I haven't taken any supplements except vitamin D3. I drank lots of tea, a few artificially sweetened drinks with zero calories, and that was it. I lost weight during the diet, but I need to give you a bit of context on that. So over the past several years, I've cycled from standard mixed diets to ketogenic diets and carnivore diets for multiple rounds of each. These diets have quite a consistent effect on my body weight. On a mixed diet with both fat and carbohydrate, I tend to sit around three and a half to four kilos heavier, and I would gain further weight if I didn't start to restrict total food intake. And on a ketogenic or carnivore diet, I tend to sit three and a half to four kilos leaner. And in this case, I'm talking about with ad libitum energy intake, i.e. letting my appetite guide the amount of food. And that weight loss is spontaneous. This time last year, I did a carnivore diet of red meat and eggs and a little bit of dairy for a couple of months. And I lost three kilos down to 65.2 kilos. I then reverted back to a mixed diet with a modest amount of carbs over the summer of 2022 and my weight went back up to 68.8 kilos which was my starting weight for this current experiment of McDonald's. During the first month of the burger patties I lost 3.5 kilos down to 65.2 in the first four weeks and then I maintained that loss for the second four weeks. So all of this is consistent with my previous experience of keto and carnivore diets where I get leaner with no conscious calorie restriction and I seem to settle out at a leaner weight. So this aspect of the experiment was exactly as I expected. So coming to well-being, in this section I'm kind of lumping together a range of aspects of health. First of all, my gut function. 
on the run-in mixed diet of moderate carbs, I would say that my gut function was acceptable, but not perfect. <laughs> I didn't really have any gut pain, but occasionally I would feel a little bit kind of gassy and bloated for some time after big meals, and occasionally had soft stools. On the burger patties, right from the word go, I would say that my gut function was 10 out of 10. As good as it's ever been or could hope for. And by that I mean no gas, no bloating, no digestive pain ever, and problem-free stools once per day. Pretty much perfect. <laughs> no doubt that that will be kind of surprising for some of you for a couple of reasons. Mostly because there are still a lot of people who believe that fibre is important for normal gut function. That might be true, but only in the context of an unhealthy Western diet. If you eat a Western diet, fibre may well improve a whole host of aspects of gut function and even health more generally. But outside of that context, it's possible that fibre becomes a solution to a problem that you don't have, if you like. Possibly its beneficial role lies in displacing refined carbohydrate, and possibly fibre might not be the only thing that we can use to displace refined carbohydrate and improve gut function. <laughs> now, we would need studies on people eating carnivore diets to show that scientifically, and so far we only have case reports. But my anecdote is consistent with those, and that was excellent gut function with zero fibre. <laughs> so what about mood? Throughout the weeks, I personally felt that my mood was very good and noticeably better and more stable than on the running mixed diet, with one very notable exception. So during the three days across Christmas, when I ate mixed meals again with starches and vegetables and some sugar, I had a marked low mood and general fatigue, and I did actually feel quite bad, to be honest. And here are some thoughts on this, which I recorded on the 27th of December, when I was on my way back to McDonald's again. <laughs> so today we're going bouldering up near Inverness. I'm gonna go and try a project that I've been trying for some time, hopefully. It will be dry, it's just after Christmas. I've just had three days off um, the McDonald's diet and I'm heading back to McDonald's right now. <clears throat> it's been really weird actually having three days off. Very interesting though, I mean, that's partly why I, I decided to extend uh, the experiment, just because um, I was interested to see, uh, rather than just having, going off it completely in one go, I thought it'd be quite interesting to go on and back off for a couple of days and just see how I feel. And I must say that over the couple of days of Christmas, I did not feel all that great. Um, my gut function was fine, you know, digestion was totally fine, but um, I, I must admit I did have quite a low mood. Quite difficult to define that and, um, you know, nothing terrible, but just, uh, just not feeling my best. I've become very used to um, a very steady good mood over the past months and in fact any time when I've been on a, a ketogenic diet of, of almost any type whether it's plant heavy or or animal foods heavy um, and I, I've often found that when I've gone back to a mixed diet that the the drop in mood or the inconsistency in, in good mood is more uh, noticeable at least at first. Maybe that's because it evens out and declines at first and that could even um, give you an indication of what could be causing it. It could be related to changes in microbiome in, in the short term. There are lots of interesting studies that correlate changes in mood and all sorts of other aspects of physiological function with acute changes in microbiome function and which is cause and which is effect or which is uh, just totally unrelated is really hard to tease out with these studies. However, they are interesting and, and um, it is uh, a plausible mechanism why someone would uh, change their diet acutely, like go back from um, a carnivore diet to a mixed diet and uh, suddenly start to feel acute changes in, in low mood. Ching! Order 87. Here we go. Right, let's go and get some burgers. I previously made a video about resolving my own depression with diet and I continue to have consistent results if I eat ketogenic diets. Ketogenic and particularly carnivore diets consistently improve and stabilise my mood symptoms. The mechanisms of action here are unclear, at least to me, <laughs> but they could be related to nutrients, to 
immune activation or to gut barrier function. We just don't know. But all I can say is that I am personally glad that I have a reliable solution to my previous mood problems that I can rely on to actually work. So what about rock climbing performance? Well, overall, it's difficult to measure the impact on my climbing performance. Throughout the period, I was almost exclusively bouldering outdoors, so I can't point to any hard results from other disciplines. But that said, my bouldering and basic strength are extremely strong predictors of my general climbing performance across any discipline. Basically, if I can boulder hard, then that's a key marker of my potential to climb anything that's hard. <laughs> Conveniently, right before the start of the experiment, I actually climbed the Fonte B, and I had briefly tried this climb last spring when I was on a carnivore diet. I almost did it last March, but I had to leave it as I was heading to the lakes to climb Lexicon, and I had actually been doing a carnivore diet as part of my preparation to do that climb. When I returned in October, on the mixed diet, I found the moves a little bit harder, which isn't all that surprising considering I was half a stone heavier. But as I tend to do, I got around this by finding an easier way to do the crux without a wild cut loose, and so I got it done. During the first month of the Patty's diet, I visited the Peak District and I climbed an 8B, Keen Roof, and its 8B plus extension, and I did both those climbs quite quickly for me, <laughs> although my technical solution for the crux is quite easy, and possibly I had an advantage there. I did feel very strong in general though, including on some other climbs which I have tried but not yet done. And during the Patty's diet, I was also trying a multi-year project of mine, which is the hardest rock climb that I've ever tried. I did feel very strong on this and I was making excellent progress. But how much of this is down to learning the movement and how much is down to strength to weight ratio changes, it's always a little bit tricky to tease out without some bias. But my feeling is that it was a bit of both. But my basic hangboard strength is a bit less sensitive to bias though. At the start of the Patty's diet, at 68.8 kilos, I could hang on one hand on a three finger drag with my body weight for about eight seconds. And that's well off my best, which I set in February of last year, also while on a carnivore diet and at 65.2 kilos. And then I did a hang of four and a half seconds with 10 kilograms in my other hand. After eight weeks of the Patty's diet at 65.3 kilos, I tried body weight, then plus four kilos, then plus 10 kilos, then plus 12. <sighs> I could just keep hanging. Oh, that's amazing. 12 kilos. That's definitely a PB. Then 12.5. It just doesn't feel that hard. That is amazing. I feel like I could actually add more weight. Weird. Then 14. Oh, that's unbelievable. That's so cool. Seems I've got stronger then 16.5 kilos in my other hand for five seconds. I mean, it, it's utterly ridiculous to think that I'd even get off the ground with this. However, I should try. It's just ridiculous. I can't believe it. Yes! Woohoo! Yeah, I, I'm surprised at the size of that improvement. That's really marked. It's not often when you're in your mid 40s. Uh, that you get like a, a, a jump in, in strength like that. Um, but it's really good. <laughs> really good. As you can see, I couldn't believe how much of a jump this was in my personal best. The difference over my previous best was equivalent to 10% of my body weight. <laughs> Interestingly, my arm pulling strength wasn't really any better or worse than before. 
And what makes this finding even more surprising to me is that I deliberately stopped training on my board for the entire duration of the McDonald's diet, except for a couple of brief sessions in the, during the last week of the experiment just to see how I felt. I did zero hangboard training since October and actually I hadn't even done all that much since last spring. The reason I avoided training during the patty diet was to try and avoid confounding any results with training effects. If the diet made me worse or better, I didn't want to obscure that with training. So I just did outdoor climbing, which I figured would maintain my form, but probably not improve it all that much. Possibly that hasn't worked out. I've always felt that going outside and trying hard on real projects that you're passionate about is actually excellent strength training. Whether it trumps the consistency of indoor training has always remained an open question in my mind. If anything, this experience makes me lean towards the idea that trying hard on projects is better than indoor training, at least some of the time. Well, either that or there are two other possibilities. One, there is some other factor that I've not accounted for, or <laughs> that pretty marked jump in my hangboard personal best can be attributed to the patties diet. <laughs> Personally, I find that quite implausible. But with that said, all the improvements that I've made to my hangboard PBs in recent years have all been while doing a carnivore diet. Six kilos this time, worth a try. Oh, yes. New PB, brilliant. In all cases, my body weight has been very similar um, at around 65 kilos. Also, when I think of times in the past when I've gone out on the rock and tried hard on projects for a few months and then come back to my board, I've kind of often felt okay, but not exactly breaking personal records. So maybe in this case, I should accept the possibility that the diet was actually beneficial to strength. I mean, we could speculate that removing all nutrient dilute foods from the diet and only eating beef, which is dense in both high quality protein and nutrients, could facilitate better gains from training. I mean, I doubt it over this time scale. <laughs> Likely, I think we'd need to see a rather longer exposure to the diet to see noticeable effects. I think it's more likely that the gain is attributable to a mix of being a little bit leaner, eating a nutrient-dense diet, and repeatedly pulling as hard as humanly possible on these really small holds during the experiment. However, one benefit of recording this discussion two months after finishing the diet is that I can say that those strength benefits have actually receded and have gone considerably backwards on both the hangboard and also on my boulder project. If there had been a real signal of harm from eating this diet of beef only, it ought to show up in something as sensitive as maximum strength. So I do find it implausible that the diet is harmful to performance in the short term. But what about the long term? <laughs> well, I have no way of knowing that, but I have no reason to think that it would be harmful. I should be specific here though, and say that I'm talking about eating only beef. If one were to eat McDonald's patties for years and years, I would still have a lingering concern that the vitamin C would be being destroyed by overcooking and that could become problematic in time, but that's just speculative. So I tested some blood markers before and after the diet and also have some interesting reference points from various diet experiments in the past. One thing that I want to emphasise before getting into the results is that like any measure, blood markers carry some inaccuracy and more importantly, they change from sample to sample, sometimes by quite a bit. So as tempting as it is, I think it's a good idea to be cautious when interpreting small changes in the values if they've moved in a certain direction that maybe fits your bias. <laughs> you could easily run the test the next day and it would be a small change in the other direction. So the reality may be that it just reflects natural daily variation and not a clinically significant change. But I think big changes are interesting. So let's go through the numbers. So here's a table of the results and I'll leave this table up for a while. So don't stress about trying to read it quickly before it disappears. For cost reasons, I only went for a slightly more comprehensive panel at the end of the experiment. I can't really afford to be doing full panels all the time. All of these were 12 hour fasted samples on the morning at the start of the diet and at the end. The final two columns on the right are the baseline at the start of the diet in November and after eight weeks of eating beef patties. 
you'll note that in the baseline bloods, the LDL and total cholesterol came back as a sample error from the lab, which does occasionally happen. It's annoying, but as you can see, I've included three columns with previous blood tests on a keto diet in 2019, a more moderate carb diet in 2020, and after six weeks of carnivore diet, eating red meat, eggs, and dairy in early 2022. I filled columns in green, which are inside the reference range used by this lab. In all diets, most of my results are within the reference ranges and they don't really move that much at all. The total and LDL cholesterol sit just outside the reference range, although they would actually fall within the reference ranges in some other Western countries, but we'll get to that in a minute. I just wanted to start with a broad point, which is that the Patty's diet has had barely any effect on most of the markers. So let's get into looking at them in turn, starting with body weight. As I described earlier, you can see that even eating a moderate amount of carbs between 100 to 150 grams per day tends to make my body weight climb by a few kilos, and this would eventually go higher still if I didn't start to restrict total food intake on this diet. Keto and carnivore diets tend to make my body weight drop and stabilize just around 65 kilos, and it remains there while eating according to appetite. That to me is really good and the Patty's diet helped me achieve this level of body weight maintenance effortlessly. No doubt this has an impact on the rest of the markers below. I put LDL cholesterol next on the list since lots of people are interested in this marker. Although I don't have the baseline from November, you can see that there isn't much movement to speak of across the different diets. The reference range tops out at 116 milligrams per deciliter. After the Patty's diet, it seems to have climbed very slightly the last time I measured it on a moderate carb diet, it was 122. So that would be a rise of five milligrams per deciliter, basically nothing. Is that a clinically significant change or is it just random fluctuation? It's hard to say, but I personally doubt that it's meaningful. I do know that on my previous carnivore diet, eating essentially the same diet, just not from McDonald's, I had the lowest reading for LDLC at 111. This is not the dramatic rise of tens or hundreds of milligrams per deciliter that some people see on low carb diets. And I could offer various speculations of why it doesn't tend to move that much in me. I think the most plausible in my mind is that what all of my diets have in common here is that they don't contain many plant fats. Plant fats, whether they are very saturated like coconut oil or unsaturated like vegetable oils, contain plant sterols, which tend to lower LDL and total cholesterol. And there's a bit of debate over whether the rises in cholesterol sometimes seen on high fat diets are due to an increase in saturated fats or just a replacement and reduction of plant fats. Although my LDLC is out of the reference range, I'm not concerned about the level, even though I know some people might be. But if I was, it would be easy to lower it with a little more carbs, some more plant fats, some more fiber, or some various other foods. Total cholesterol I'm going to skip since I have no reason to want to alter it. HDLC, the cholesterol content of high density lipoproteins, also tends to stay fairly constant. If you just take the baseline in November, it looks like there's been a small increase, but I'm not convinced that that's not just fluctuation rather than a significant change. You don't really want to see your HDL fall. Often people on vegan diets have low LDL and low HDL and feel good about the low LDL, but I wouldn't be too happy with that profile myself. Things get a bit more interesting when we get to triglycerides. So trigs are the fats that are packaged up by your liver and sent off in VLDL particles for storage in fat tissue or burning in muscle for energy. And you want to see them nice and low, ideally under 100, but lower still is better. Essentially, this is a measure of the energy state of your body and people who are obese or have type two diabetes tend to have sky high trigs and that's a sign that the body is flooded with too much energy and it doesn't have anywhere to put it. The Patty's diet does look more like a real drop in triglycerides. I don't really have much of an explanation for why it's so much lower eating burger patties than it was eating steak and eggs, but possibly I was having slightly more dairy in the previous carnivore diet. Other than that, I'm struggling to explain this other than to reiterate that it's likely better not to get too fixated on small changes in these numbers and to stand back and look at the bigger picture. With that said, the last lipid measure is worth drawing attention to, I think. The ratio of triglycerides to HDL is the most reliable marker on the lipid panel for insulin resistance, for future heart disease risk, for future diabetes risk, 
and even things like energy expenditure. It's also a close proxy for APOB and LDL particle size. So why is that important? Large buoyant LDL particles are not consistently correlated with cardiovascular health. Conversely, LDL particles that have become damaged by an unhealthy and insulin resistant metabolic state do correlate more powerfully with cardiovascular health. So this is possibly the most important line on the whole table, in my opinion. If that trig to HDL ratio was up at two or even three, I would not be happy that would indicate the likely presence of damaged LDL particles, damage to the artery wall, and a future health risk. Under 1.5 is considered good for this marker, but under 1 is excellent, and the likelihood of having damaged LDL if the ratio is, falls below 1 is close to 0. And so the fact that eating McDonald's burger patties gets me from previous values between 1.2 and 1.5 down to 0.7 looks like an excellent result. Of course, I'd presumably have to keep eating this way, to keep my metabolism in such a healthy state. As I said above, I take the exact numbers with a pinch of salt since it can clearly vary quite a lot on a very similar diet, but it certainly doesn't show that the patties are moving metabolic health in the wrong direction. Going on further down the table, that is further supported by the high sensitivity C-reactive protein. This is a marker of acute inflammation and sometimes it can be tricky to interpret in athletes if it's elevated because that might simply reflect the inflammatory response needed to recover from a training session. Same goes for the liver enzymes, which I'll come to in a second. It's commonly stated that you would want to see CRP under 2 to indicate low levels of ongoing inflammation in the body. I would personally not be too happy at 2 and I would want to see this number under 1. And as you can see, it barely moves across the different diets all result in very low levels of inflammation, at least measured by this marker. Very high ferritin can also indicate a strong inflammatory response, and this marker doesn't indicate this either. The liver enzymes all look fine with almost no change to speak of. Bilirubin, the breakdown product of haemoglobin, did take a small jump up just out of the reference range, and I don't really have any explanation for that. I suppose it could be post-hepatic, since there might have been gut flora changes to it during the diet, I doubt that it's intrahepatic change since the liver enzymes are normal. It would be interesting to see if that just goes back down in the future tests or if that's actually a meaningful change. Slightly higher bilirubin actually has some possible health benefits, so perhaps this could even be beneficial. But obviously I would investigate it if it ever went really high. My active B12, that is holotranscobalamin, went up a bit and interestingly that is the same as last time I was eating a carnivore diet. Most omnivores need to supplement vitamin B12, not just vegans, and that's for the simple reason that most omnivores don't eat nearly enough red meat. If you're measuring vitamin B12, do try and make sure that you measure whole OTC and not serum B12, as this can give you a false impression of body stores. My vitamin D is running a little bit low, and I'll up my supplement again. <laughs> I dropped my supplement from 4,000 IUs of vitamin D3 this year down to 3,000 IUs, and I also didn't take it for a few months for no particular reason. I just got out of the habit, and this has been a nice reminder that I need to keep taking it. My magnesium has come back very slightly high in two tests and I do supplement magnesium so possibly I'm taking a little bit more than I need. I'll maybe do a separate video sometime on the very short list of supplements that I take. The last thing of note is that my testosterone consistently sits at the high end of normal, especially for an older married man with kids. <laughs> it normally drops in this scenario and I'm kind of glad that mine is still high. I can't really point to a single explanation for it other than general good health, good diet, sun exposure, vitamin D, good sleep and stress management, but I can't really tell you which, if any of those, could explain my values or whether it's just genetic. I haven't actually put all the markers on this table. There were some others such as a thyroid hormone panel, but all the others were normal. So that's my blood panel. <laughs> if I stand back and look at the whole thing, I think it's pretty good overall, and it's also what I expected. Beef is healthy, nutritious food, and I wouldn't expect it to make me inflamed, insulin resistant, or nutritionally deficient. Now, if you added another column and you ran the experiment again, eating the whole McDonald's meal, I would put money on it looking worse, but I'm not going to try that. I do like taking risks, but not stupid ones. <laughs> so overall, I've got three takeaways from this experiment, which I'll just list. 
First, eating only beef from McDonald's for eight weeks had no negative effects on my health that I could find and possibly some benefit to general health status, to mood, to gut function, to appetite regulation and maybe even sport performance. Personally, I have no intention of continuing to eat at McDonald's, but I wouldn't have any worries about eating a carnivore diet myself over the longer term, and each of my several rounds of the carnivore diet have supported that conclusion. I do wonder that for people who regularly consume junk food and have problems with breaking their habit of eating from places like McDonald's, if this approach could help at least a subset of them to regain control over their eating habits and hence metabolic diseases like obesity. I'd love to see that studied scientifically someday, but I'm not going to hold my breath. <laughs> eating this way, I lost body fat while eating as much as I wanted. I lost my constant low-level cravings for junk food or just additional excess calories in general. For me, that was a really big benefit, and for some people, it might actually be life-changing. In my previous carnivore diet experiments, I lost my lifelong eczema, which again was a life-changing effect for me. I want to be clear on what I'm not saying, though. I'm not suggesting that anyone should actively choose to eat McDonald's food or a carnivore diet. That's not the point of this video. It's self-evident from any study of diets around the world that eating a mixture of animal and plant foods can result in excellent lifelong health for most people. The point that I wish to make is that if you feel your health could be better than it is now, then radical diets, <laughs> maybe even some diets that fall outside of your cultural norm, might be worth considering as a therapy either temporarily or permanently. My second conclusion is that in my reading of the scientific literature, I don't have any worries, generally speaking, about the healthfulness of eating red meat, and this experiment has been a way to highlight that. If you as an individual, or all of us as society, want to restrict red meat intake, then let's at least make sure that we're doing it for the right reason. I don't think that reducing red meat intake to improve health is one of them. People also sometimes decide to reduce meat consumption for ethical or environmental reasons. Personally, I prefer just to source animal foods that have been produced in an ethical and environmentally sustainable manner. There is a legitimate and a real debate about how to achieve an environmentally sound food supply at a world level, but in my view, this debate is derailed or even corrupted by the view that meat is unhealthy and therefore there is no downside to its restriction. I think that has the potential to do a lot of harm to both humans and the environment. It's really important if we're arguing these things to argue the facts. The third conclusion that I have is that McDonald's is rammed full of people and it's so busy selling junk food to long queues of folk. It's just crazy, it's mind blowing to me. The whole meals that they sell are doing a superb job of completing the population transition to obesity and metabolic illness and the collapse of every major health service in the developed world. Earlier in this video, I asked the question, what's an extreme diet? And in my view, the whole McDonald's meal and the wider Western diet that's characterized by refined fats and carbohydrates uh, and also the dilution of nutrients to me, that's extreme, and it's extremely bad, and it's destroying health at a blistering pace. In contrast, my extreme diet of beef patties had markedly different effects to Morgan Spurlock in the movie Super Size Me. I thought the results were pretty good, <laughs> and in my view, those results have happened because the diet is a simple whole natural food, which is nutrient dense and it's absent refined energy. And I think it has that in common with any diet which increases nutrient density. And that's generally easier to achieve if you include animal foods in the diet, especially eggs and red meat, which are actually two of the best foods that I know about. Nutrient dense fruits and vegetables are also good foods, of course. <laughs> there is more than one way to have a healthy diet for most people. I think healthy people can thrive on a whole range of omnivorous diets. I think it's kind of a shame that nutrition science is either not sufficiently curious or incentivized to study these diets, and so we only have some anecdotes and case reports to tell us that there seems to be a small subset of people who drastically improve existing health conditions such as excess fat and diabetes and autoimmune conditions or even mental illness with these so-called extreme diets, including carnivore diets. If a few people do well with these diets, I think we should be kind of careful about vilifying them if you think about my own case, I resolved mild to moderate depression and eczema for this diet, and I think that's a pretty profound health improvement to deny someone if you feel their diet's extreme. 
I mean, even if you just remove all the compassion and just think about it in transactional terms, I still think it's worth considering. For example, it would be really difficult for me to add up the carbon cost of all the decades of steroid medication that I took and all the hospital stays and visits and all the dressings and hydration creams. So it's not fair just to look at the carbon cost of the food and not its downstream effects. If we do that, then we could get the wrong answer. The monetary and environmental and human costs of treating ill health actually adds up to a lot. So overall, if there are some people who do well on any particular diet and it's helped them, I'm inclined to let them follow it and not to vilify them as extremists. So what follows is the one recommendation that I have for you from this experiment. Familiarise yourself with PubMed, the database of life science papers. Learn how to read and interpret different types of scientific study. That might not be easy, but it is easier than placing your trust blindly in others who might not have your best interests at heart and then suffering the consequences. If one of you watches this video and thinks, hmm, what actually is the evidence that eating beef is unhealthy? I think I'm going to check, then this experiment will have been worth it. So thanks very much for watching this episode all the way through and I'll see you in the next one.